you done now. Hi, everybody. This is Bob Gale, co-creator of Back to the Future, and you're listening to Brad Gilmore. Doc! 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 Okay, relax, Doc. It's me. It's me. It's Martin. Doc, oh, it can't be. Just sent you back to the future. Yeah. Oh, I know. He did send me back to the future, but I'm back. I'm back from the future. Great. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Doc. Uh, are you telling me that you built a time machine? Kind of a DeLorean? The way I see it, if you're going to build a time machine into a car, why not do it with some style? Everybody and welcome to Back to the Future Podcast, the only podcast looking back in time for this film trilogy of all time, Back to the Future. I'm your friend in time, Brad Gilmore, and welcome. Welcome one and welcome all to Season 9 of Back to the Future, the podcast. If you are somebody who has listened since the first episode of the first season, thank you. Thank you for sticking with me for these seven years. Seven years. I've been doing the show. Seven years. It's kind of wild to me but um thank you for joining us if this is your first time checking out the show uh thank you for joining us we are on a new podcasting platform uh new network so i really do appreciate it if you have found us through to some crazy algorithm that i do not understand and probably never will but thank you for finding us my name is brad gilmore i've hosted this show since 2015 not coincidentally not ironically but rather purposefully because i was sitting in my university professor's class and instead of listening to his lecture on why we are the way we are and some kind of greek philosophy that he was spitting that i don't remember um i had the idea of what if i did like a retrospective on back to the future because there's no back to the future podcast out there i could do the back to the future podcast that's what this is so thank you for joining us today we have a really fun show and a fun season planned out for you this one i'm very excited about i'm going to talk about our guest here momentarily um but Uh, Again, I want to thank everybody for supporting the show. Make sure you go rate us five stars. Listen to all the episodes. Even if you have heard them before, catch up on past seasons of the podcast. That's really going to help us on this new platform we're on. So um, it would be very appreciated by me. And it would also be appreciated if you check out my book, Back from the Future, a celebration of the greatest time travel story ever told, available wherever books are sold. And you know, it's, um, it's been fun. I mentioned in the time capsule episode that closed us out on season eight, that I got married recently and everywhere my bride and I travel to, we travel a lot, um, or at least we try to, and it's our goal to travel a lot. We, um, always try to find like a Barnes and Noble. And this is just something that that I want to, you know, do because it's crazy that I have a book in a store. Now I have two books in a store. If you include Bond, James Bond, um, I go in the store and I look to see if it's there. And if it is, I, I, take it off the shelf and I sign it. So there are books in Portland, Los Angeles, um, Seattle, uh, amongst other places that I've taken off the shelf and signed. Maybe they're still there. Maybe they're not. But if you're at a Barnes and Noble close to one of those locations, go check it out. Today on the show, we have a phenomenal guest, somebody who um, I'm really excited to talk to. And I'll tell you a little bit of background about how this came to be. One of my um, favorite shows growing up and to this day uh, is a show called Psych. Psych's been around since I believe like 2006, maybe. Um, and in 2006, I was a young man, and I would always watch Monday Night Raw, and I would see the promos for Psych, a show about a fake psychic detective. And the opening credits are very uh, contagious. They sing the song "I Know You Know," and at the end of them, it says "Created by Steve Franks." So that show ran for several seasons, eight seasons. And it concluded, I believe, in 2014. And then they started to come out with psych movies a few years later. And in, must have been November of this year, they did a uh, psych press junket. And I got to attend and be a part of the press junket. And you got to interview a multitude of, of different people. So I interviewed the stars, James Roday and Dulé Hill, Maggie Lawson, I got to talk to uh, Kirsten and Jasmine. And then the, the last interview they scheduled me for was with the creator and producer of the show, Chris Hensey and Steve Franks. And Steve and I, in, in the middle of the interview, you know, we're talking and, and we're enjoying it. And somehow Back to the Future came up. I don't remember. Oh, I was asking him about time travel and why we never got a time travel story in Psych. 
And um, we actually talk about that in the episode today. But I was asking him about that. And because um, I said, you know, I wrote a book on Back to the Future. And, you know, I'd lo- I would have loved to see that in psych. And during the interview, he pulled out his phone and actually Googled. I don't know if he Googled me or he Googled Back to the Future book, but it came up. And I remember him showing me the screen on his phone. And he said, is this your book? And I said, yeah. He goes, well, I'm going to buy it right now. I said, no, I'll do you one better. I'll send you a copy. And how about you come on Back to the Future, the podcast? So that was uh, November of last year. And um, we finally were able to, to sit down and find the day and time that worked for us all. And I'll be honest with you. It was such a fun, fun interview. He is... Um, in a lot of ways, a perfect podcast guest. And I mean that seriously, at least for me, because we share the same interests of, of film, of 80s movies, and um, he created one of my favorite shows ever. And I, when I mean that, Tyke, Tyke, Psych is top three, and it's not three for me. It's either Psych or Seinfeld, which is my favorite show of all time. So you never checked out Psych. It's definitely worth it, especially if you're an 80s fan. If you're listening to this show, you would like that one. Um, so we had a lot of fun, so I do want to get into that interview and I'm going to talk a little bit about more about Steve Franks here in a second, but we, um, several months ago, uh, or a couple months back, we lost another comedy legend, the great Gilbert Gottfried and Gilbert is somebody who, um, again, has been around for forever and is one of the funniest human beings of all time known for looking for where the line is and jumping over it, not just stepping over it. And he has that iconic voice. Back in February, I actually got to interview him. And uh, he was promoting something at the time, I think his podcast, which is also really great. And um, I I talked to him back in February, and then a couple months later he passed. And it's just such a a loss to the comedy community. He's such an innovator, uh, a unique style. But one of the things he was best at, anybody who worked with him would talk about how he was a tr- tremendous and a phenomenal improvisational actor. And when I had him on the show, and th- this is the reason I'm bringing this up, because Steve and I talk about Beverly Hills Cop a little bit in uh, today's episode. And when I had him on the show, Gilbert, I wanted to ask him about that great scene of him and Eddie Murphy in Beverly Hills Cop 2. And just to honor the great Gilbert Gottfried on Back to the Future, the podcast. I just want to play, it's about a 90-second clip of, of me asking him that about Beverly Hills Cop 2 and him just talking about working with Eddie Murphy and how that scene that I love, and I'm sure you love if you're a, a Cop 2 fan, how that scene came to be and uh, all the things that we didn't get to see. So here's Gilbert Gottfried right now on the show. Let me just ask this, since, you know, you have the stand-up background, SNL, things of that nature. When you're doing a movie like Aladdin, or you're doing Problem Child, or Beverly Hills Cop might even be a better example, because in the first Beverly Hills Cop, Eddie Murphy legendarily, like, improvised so much of his lines in the film. Um, When you're on these sets, do you like to just throw lines out there during takes, or are you somebody who sticks to the script? Oh, I... I yeah, no, I, it's like when we, that's the scene with me and Eddie in, uh, Beverly Hills Cop 2, that was all improv. We just, uh, every, like, I wish I had a tape of all the different, uh, versions we did. Cause we were just like, you know, playing off each other. One would say something, the other would just answer back. And it was, that was, uh, Yes, yeah, so that was a lot of improv. A lot, lot of improv, and I can only imagine the scenes uh, or the takes that we didn't get to see from Beverly Hills Cop 2 because Eddie Murphy and, and Gilbert Gottfried firing back and forth at each other. God, man, to be a fly on the wall. Oh, to be a fly on the wall of that conversation. Um, but today, we are talking to Steve Franks. Steve Franks, the creator of Psych and a massive Back to the Future fan. We talk about... Um, we talked about so much in this podcast. I, I normally, you know, long-term listeners of the show, I like to take the interviews maybe 30 minutes, you know, 40 minutes at the most, maybe 20. Um, and the only reason I like to do that is, you know, I, I don't want uh, to take up too much of my guest time. Uh, and Steve and I start talking, and I look down at the clock, and I was like, oh, my gosh, we're like an hour 15 in, you know? And so um, 
we, uh, we, and we could have talked more, but so I thought, you know what, this is a, such a great conversation. Steve Franks is literally a perfect podcast guest, and I'm not trying to overhype this at all, but this might be my favorite thing we've done on the show in a long time, if maybe ever, just the conversation with Steve, because he is so, so good, and he loves film, loves the 80s, loves time travel, so we're going to talk about all that, but because we went an hour and a half, I decided to split this into two parts, two parts, so you'll get one this week, one next week on our season premiere of the show, and then we'll continue on with so many fun things I have already recorded and planned for this season of Back to the Future, the podcast. So without further ado, here is the man who created Psych and a man who is a wealth of information about all things Back to the Future, amusement parks, the 1980s, and more. But before we get into it with Steve Franks, I have a couple little notes that I scribbled on a pink post and note that I have to say because we talk about this in the interview. I mistakenly said that Eddie Murphy stars in the Fletch films. Of course, that's Chevy Chase. Gregory McDonald is the author of the Fletch books. So I highly recommend those if you haven't checked them out. And John Hamm is the actor's name who will be in Confess Fletch, the remake to the Fletch series. But without further ado, here's part one with my conversation with the creator of Psych, Steve Franks here exclusively on Back to the Future, the podcast. And he joins me right now on the show, one of the guys I'm so excited to talk about, Back to the Future, talk about the 80s with, you might know him as the creator of Psych, he also wrote movies you've heard of, Big Daddy, and I heard at one point he worked in the Enchanted Tiki Room, he is none other than Steve Frank. Steve, welcome to the show. I actually started my movie career in the Enchanted Tiki Room, because I I wrote the script for Big Daddy while I was supposed to be waking up the bird uh, <laughs> inside the room, and there was a little adjacent office there that uh, that there was it, that that ride had its own office and its own restroom, so it's the greatest place to work ever. And you didn't have to wear a hat, which was a big thing too, because your hair you would get hat hair by the end of the day at Disney. So uh, so I, I'd go in there and I, you're supposed to wake up the bird and sit and watch the show, make sure the animation didn't explode and, and shoot hydraulic fluid all over the audience. And I would just sneak out and start writing a uh, writing screenplay, go into film school. And uh, and so the Tiki Room is is responsible for uh, for my whole career. Well, look at that. Around what year are we talking? Like what year were you in the Tiki well, Room? I'm talking about the 90s. Okay. Like the, the classic heart of the 90s uh, uh, Tiki Room. Tiki Room pretty much hasn't changed. <laughs> except now, except now they kind of, they used, used to be, you couldn't bring food in there. And, you know, there was very strict, you know, turnstile and you'd have to take, you have to count all the people that go in there. Now they don't care. As many people, as much food as you want, change the baby on the seat. It doesn't matter. Just it's a free for all in there, and uh, uh, it's still still the most relaxing show that you can uh, that you can experience at the uh, at the Disney property. It's a nice, especially if you're at Disneyland. It's a nice little one too when you can like if you've been in lines all day. It's hot. You're sweating. Let's like let's do the Jungle Cruise and cool off. Then we'll go to the Tiki yep. Room, have a little something, something, and then we can go stand in line for an hour and a half for Space Mountain, right? Yeah, exactly. And the great, one of the greatest air conditionings in the whole park, because you know it's a small room with a massive air air conditioning unit in there, so it gets very, very cold. So it's so, it, I, I recommend it for everybody. Being a, a how long were you a cast member? Eight and a half years. Eight and a half years. Okay, so th- you're the guy to ask. What oh, yeah. is Okay, I'm at Disneyland. I have four hours, right? I mean, I got to get in. I got to get out. What's the best that I can do? Like, what are my three, Steve Frank's three must ride rides if I only have (laughs) that limited time? Well, to me, it's like, I think, you know, minute for minute and the wait, Big Thunder Mountain is the the best time you can spend in a queue because you get through pretty quickly. It's a great ride, uh, you know, and uh, and you know it's a nice little area. There's there's stuff to look at. So I would always say Big Thunder. I mean, now if you start talking Star Wars land, I still haven't seen Rise of the Resistance. I haven't either. Uh, I think I think you can you you don't have to work too hard to go on the Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run. It's fine. Uh, but, uh, it doesn't, doesn't take anything beyond the star tours. 
of it all. Uh, I'm a big I'm a big proponent of the Mad Tea Party because uh, <laughs> it's great and exciting. Uh, you know, Matterhorn's a little rough, but um, but if you if you if you can handle it, it's also a pretty good uh, pretty good run. Space Mountain's a classic, but sure. you're going to get a 70 minute line all the time. So. What I say is always spread it out. Try don't don't go and try to just run from ride to ride to ride because Disneyland is always about the the environments, the sound, the feel of when you're when you're there. And uh, I used to get so much riding done because you know it's a hyper realistic environment that uh, you know there's there's always something to stimulate your creativity. Uh, so even you know I would when I was working there I was in college and then I was still working there and I was in film school in grad school and I would come back and I would write I would go I'd go right up in the uh, it's a Tomorrowland Terrace and uh, you know and and uh, you know ride the train I would sit there and ride the train just take l- laps around there and I'd come up with so many script ideas so it's a it's a great creative place it's a great place to sort of unwind there's a lot of good food options. Ride some rides, but don't make that the whole thing that you got to do. I, you know what? I agree with you. It is a nice place just to be. Uh, you don't have to always be in a queue, even if you take the little monorail around. I'm surprised, though, there's no love for Pirates of the Caribbean. Like, you don't have any Pirates love? Oh, oh no, I love Pirates. I, okay. I absolutely love Pirates. I When I, when I was there, they, they divided into different areas. So it's Adventureland, Frontierland. That was mm-hmm. the areas that you were allowed to work. And then I also worked guest control on the parades because I'm 6'8", and I could tell people to sit down where the horses were pooping earlier. And... Uh, <laughs> And, and line up for the electrical parade, Lion King parade, whatever parade happens to be coming uh, at that time. And uh, and we merged. There was like this big merge, like on Survivor. But this time it was Adventureland, Critter Country, which uh, was used to be Bear Country and New Orleans Square. So you're allowed to like pick one ride that you could learn. And I was I was torn because I love pirates. I love the smell of pirates. I know yeah. it's a weird smell, but it's just it screams Disneyland childhood to me. Uh, but I had to choose Haunted Mansion because, I mean, when else do you get to wear a thick green polyester three-piece suit with tails? Uh, you know, <laughs> I wear one every Thursday, but oh, yeah. most people, yeah, exactly. most people don't yeah, exactly. have that opportunity. Yeah, exactly. It's especially good in Houston. It's yeah. the best. Uh, it's the best outfit for Houston. You know, I mean, given it. our climate, that's exactly what I need to do every day. <laughs> but I, I did Mansion because Mansion is just uh, it's great. You can actually stay inside there the entire day uh, and uh, and not leave. There's a there's a kitchen. There's a television inside the mansion. There's uh, it's once again, air conditioned. And if you're looking to get steps on your pedometer, you just have everybody bump around you at, uh, at unload on the belt. And you're just you're just walking all day long, just waving people uh, out. <laughs> oh, Haunted Mansion is a classic. I mean, they're all they're all classics. D- Disneyland is. Um, and I'm assuming you're more of a Disney guy than a Universal. Or do you like them you know both? What? Well, you know, I love I do. I love, I'm, a, I'm a fan of theme parks. Same. I like the I like the the theme in theme parks. So I, I lean towards the universals and the, and the Disney's as opposed to just like the King's Island or, or whatever, you know, traditional amusement parks are. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, when we were doing psych, I, uh, I like in the first season, I said, all right, we have all these rides here. We're going to do a version of every one of these rides. So we did a mummy mummy episode. <laughs> we did a dinosaur episode. The one we didn't pull off was back to the future. Right. Um, strangely enough, which draws us back into this, but, uh, um, but I do, I, I, I love, I love once again, I had an annual pass <laughs> when I was, when I was in film school and I would come ride the tram around and uh, with my notebook. I'm this guy who just, I can't write anywhere where I'm static or it's completely quiet. I need like a, a bed of noise and energy and especially music, you know, like theme park music. Uh, area loops are fantastic for me for uh, for writing. Yeah, you know what? It makes a lot of sense. When I was writing uh, my second book, the Bond book, I would actually just go, walk out outdoors around my neighborhood just walk with my iphone and type up notes and then then you know email them to myself get back edit them you know read through them because half of it didn't make sense because i was focused on you know an owl that landed on the fence in somebody's yard or what have you but but overall i, I like the being you know that kinetic energy that you kind of get from walking around or being somewhere else because i'm like you if i'm sitting static it's hard to spark anything that's why i would say i couldn't be a guy who worked from home you know i couldn't work a yeah. remote job i would just not work 
<laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> it's a matter of getting yourself up. And I used to always, I always say, I, I need to get the the writing room on the team on the, on their feet. So we would go for a walk, and uh, we were in Manhattan Beach, our writers' room, and we'd get up, we start walking. And just like you said, like 10 minutes in, suddenly you're not thinking about whatever you were thinking about 10 minutes ago. And then 15 minutes in, suddenly the ideas start to come. So you get exercise, you get outside, you get vitamin D if that's what the sun gives you. And then uh, <laughs> and then you get the creativity, the spark, you know, you, you, you make your brain do something else. And it opens up the answers to your to your questions. Yeah, it's it's so incredible, you know. And I, and I want to talk to you about the writing process a little bit because of Back to the Future, the film that we're here to talk about, really, or the series of movies we're here to talk about. Because whenever um, you you, I mean, I you know look at people on YouTube or do other interviews, and I even talk to the guys who wrote the Inhu- uh, not the Inhumans. What was the Marvel movie that just came out uh, f- last year? The uh, Oh Not my the God. Eternals. The Eternals. Yes, the Eternals. Okay, there we go. All uh, right. uh, the guys who wrote the Eternals, they said that they even used the same method that Back to the Future used because it works so well in Back to the Future that they use a note card method. You know, this happens in the story, and then and I see the note cards behind you, which is I was about to bring up. So is that kind <laughs> of your writing process too? Of okay, here's my idea, and if if we're going to establish that Marty is plays guitar or he's going to invent rock and roll, we got to establish that he plays guitar. If he's going to invent skateboarding, we have to establish earlier in the skate uh, in the movie that he invents skateboarding. Do you have a, a similar structure? Is that something that's taught in film school or or? Well, yeah, I think you know. I think that, that there's so many ways to go about it that it's whatever suits you. You know, I'm a. I can't stare at just a laptop screen. And oh yeah, there's 35 pages behind this. I want to feel the 35 pages. I want to know that I'm that much into it. So I do, I like the note cards. I have note cards behind me and I also have post-it notes on a uh, on a little like teach a teach a sixth grader how to uh, how to do, you know, cursive and calligraphy. Uh, so for me, it's like every format, the, the more I can move it from one thing to another, I print out scripts. And then I write on the scripts and I take them back to the computer. But I, I, there's something about seeing a note card and being able to pull the pen out and move it around that, uh, that really gives you sort of a sense of a place and where you are. So I think you, you use all of them, but I love, I love note cards. And I've just gotten organized enough in my life that I can color code them to, uh, <laughs> to, uh, to a, a storyline. I, I have a huge one that you can't see right over here. Yeah. That's, uh, um, that's a giant movie. And I, I did this amazing color coding and I went away and did the last psych movie and I came back and I go, all right, time to get back in. And I can't figure out what each color means. <laughs> I'm like, I think that's the, the main girl and her sister on yellow, but I'm not sure. So I think I'll have to start over, but I think e- rewriting it every time I rewrite it, I, I, I solve something else. So yeah. I like it all. And if you, if you write on final draft, final draft actually has like digital note cards and beat boards and you can drag pictures in. And it's like, there's so many tools and, and use them all because yeah. it should be fun. You know, it's, it, it's fun to, to learn new things. And it's fun to create. And you know, the, the thing though, that you, when you're saying like you have this color coding system, can't remember what it is. Has it, has that happened to you in other ways? You know, for instance, you know, I have a notepad by my bed. So whenever I come up, if I wake up in the middle of the night, I'm like, oh, that's a really good idea. Or I'm about to go to bed. Okay, let me jot it down or I'll jot it down in my phone. And then I'll look at it the next day or a couple of weeks later. I'm like, wait a minute. What did I mean? Fried green tomatoes. Like, what was the setup <laughs> for this? I don't understand what that what that note was. <laughs> You have to write them all down. And yeah, that's your that's your nighttime brain. And at some point you may crack it or, or it may be lost to the ether forever. <laughs> but yeah, I have a notebook. I, I, you know, you're never off, you know, you, when you're writing because you, you you're constantly getting ideas. I go to the movies, I get popcorn and then I get 12 napkins. And then I fold them over at the at the crease very nicely, and I set them down because I come up with so many ideas in a movie theater, and I write them down in the dark. And most of the time, they're completely illegible. And even during Doctor Strange this weekend, I, I'm like, "This is the greatest line," and I wrote it down, and I have no <laughs> idea what it was. And it was like an hour and a half later, like, "What did I mean?" I was really excited about that. But I do keep the napkins for a little while until until they start to until they they go back to the earth. And I'm like, <laughs> all right, uh, okay, I guess that one's gone forever. Um, so so I guess we we can start getting into a little bit more of even your background though. So you said you wrote Big Daddy in the Tiki Room, Enchanted Tiki Room. Um, but 
I see. I watched this show on Netflix. The movies that made us. I'm sure that you may have love seen it. this before. Love yeah, that love show. how it's shot. They actually have a a similar one for Disney on on Disney Plus, like the the rides that made us or something like that. But yeah, um, I'll also love that. I, I love anything that made us. The food that made us. <laughs> The toys that made us. Yes, exactly. They, they have them all. But um, one of the interesting ones that I saw was the story of Pretty Woman and how it started off as a gritty script called 3000 where she dies at the end and she's a drug addict and things like this nature. For Big Daddy, I mean, me growing up, I mean, my last name's Gilmore. It's hard to get away from Adam uh-huh. Sandler. You know, I mean, I've been called Happy Gilmore my entire life. So those Adam Sandler movies, especially ones from the 90s and uh, Billy Madison uh, water boy, big daddy. Those are ones that are kind of synonymous with my life in a lot of ways. So what we saw from big daddy on screen from script to screen, how different was it? Was it very true to what your initial concept was or. Yeah. You know, the funny thing is before Sandler came involved, big daddy, strangely enough, I had a, had a, had a title that I loved, which was never going to stay, but it's called guy gets kid. And basically I like titles that just give you the concept. And uh, and it took place in a theme park, oddly enough. Oh, okay. And it was it was a guy and his roommate. And his roommate has a kid dropped off at the door, which is just it happens in the movie. And then surprisingly, the guy who has not developed as a human being at all is the one who steps up. And the guy who's supposed to be, you know, on his way, the John Stewart character is the one who sort of, you know, doesn't step up and, until the very end. And then you have emotion and he's changed by the experience. So that all stayed the relationship with the kid. But when Sandler came on board and, and once again, I'm a guy who's working in the Tiki room. And I also was uh, doing a second job on the desk of one of those uh, women in jeopardy movie, of the week companies <laughs> that they used to, that they used to now are on lifetime, but used to be even be on networks. So for me, I was like, this is so exciting. I can't believe this thing sold and all that stuff. And uh, I was, uh, I was there. We were scouting Knott's Berry farm as one of the locations. We had a director. It was, it was going to be great. The rewrite was, uh, was really awesome. And then they go, Oh, we got Sandler. I'm like, Oh my God. And my luck is so amazing. And then they're like, yeah, you don't need to come to the next meeting. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, I don't mind. I don't mind driving. So, so Sandler and his guys, they kind of take it off and they do their own thing. And there, there's some things that, you know, so many things that I love that they did to it. And some things that go, ah, I got to wish that they, uh, they'd have kept that or they'd kept that. So tonally, you know, you get the structure of the movie. It's, it, there was a lot changed. Um, and, but it, they didn't completely destroy it, you know, and, and, you know, obviously destroy. That's a, that's a strong word. I was happy for the experience. And, uh, um, but if that got made today and I was directing it, uh, you know, I would, I would have kept my stuff cause I'm a huge fan of my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, obviously, you know, uh, it, it's so hard. I remember sending in, you know, chapters to a publisher or, or the complete manuscript and they're like, Hey, can we take like this chapter just completely out? And I'm like, ah, uh, but those are my words. I love my words. I spent time on my words. So, uh, yeah, you know, and the funny thing too, though, is like, I, I'm, I have just have gratitude to be able to play in this business and to be able to do this, especially at the time, you know, one, one year removed from pushing the, uh, the button at the Haunted Mansion. So it was great. I got to go out and be there for the, uh, I got to see him shoot some of the stuff and uh, I got to go to New York. We, I went to the Waterboy premiere, which, uh, uh <laughs> which was exciting to me. And, hot uh, ticket. It was a hot ticket. It, yeah, exactly. So, but I, you know, I wasn't, I, I wasn't super precious about, oh, this word was gone. This word was gone. I would have liked these things. I like, oh, that scene would have been really good. Um, but it all worked out. It worked out for everybody. So, um, you know, I, I was very, very happy to have a movie made and, and for it to get going. And then from there, I'm like, okay, now what do I do? Uh, and so, it, and it, and it ended up, you know, gave me the opportunity to go pitch things and, uh, and come up with the next set of ideas. And strangely enough, what happened out of, uh, big daddy is, is Columbia said, Hey, uh, do you have any other ideas? And it's, you know, we'll, uh, we'll sign you to a blind deal and come pitch us five things. So I went and pitched them five things and they, they're like, no, 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 no. The fifth one was. Uh, a thing called fake psychic detective. And it was going to be, it was going to be an Adam Sandler, Drew Barrymore romantic comedy about a guy who's in trouble. He's in a courthouse. He hears this case. 
he's his dad has sort of uh, you know has given him these sort of abilities, and he solves he he knows the answer to it, and he stands up, and they're like, well, how do you know? Thinking he might have been involved, and he's like, uh, I'm psychic, <laughs> and uh, and they said no to that. <laughs> And then I thought, oh, hey, maybe that's a TV show. And, uh, you know, a couple of years later, pitches a TV show and sold it in the room. So it's incredible. It's incredible how you how you get there, Um, you know, especially when I hear fake psychic. I guess it's you hear the pitch now and you know what the show became. So you're like, how did nobody bite on this? But, you know, Uh, I can I can see that sometimes it it, maybe it was a hard sell from Columbia. Didn't see it. Right. Well, and it might sound like it's one joke because if the only thing you play is the one joke, you know, then it doesn't have much of a shelf life. But we, I had a lot of more, (laughs) I'm like, there's a lot more involved to this guy. So, uh, you know, and and fortunately USA was, was willing to go along on the journey, especially as it started getting crazier and crazier and crazier and crazier. And we started expanding the world and got to where we really wanted to be. Yeah. You know, a lot of those USA shows. So I'm a massive hellacious pro wrestling fan. Uh, oh, yeah. and been around pro wrestling, you know, for the last 10 years. So Psych would come on, I think either, maybe, I don't know if it came on after Raw, but I remember they would always run commercials for Psych during Monday Night Raw. And and that was where I first heard of it and saw it. And then, you know, we got into it and obviously Psych is just so brilliant. And, and I have questions about Psych, but you coming, uh, you're writing in the 90s, had to have been inspired though by a lot of the stuff you saw in the 80s. Right. I mean, oh, that was yeah. that was your prime. I mean, I'm thinking if you're in college, you're probably a teenager around yeah, the 80s. So I was in college. Yeah, I was in college in the yeah in the 90s and, and the end of the 80s and then high school and, and middle school at that point. So, yeah, the 80s, you know, you devoured everything. Music meant everything. A new mm-hmm. album coming out on, on Friday or Tuesday when it used to be Tuesday, used to be Tuesday you yeah. know. It was, uh, you know, it was the, it was change your life, you know? So that, that was, and you bought the album. I, I've, I feel so bad for musicians now that everyone just has it delivered to their Spotify and all that. But, you know, you, I would, I would spend all my money on records or, you know, VHS or DVD when, the, when that became a thing. And, and you just, you, you devoured these things and they're, they were so important to you. And when you, when you had no other responsibilities. <laughs> Well, I mean, for me, even though I'm not, I didn't, I didn't get to grow up during that time. The the '80s movies, for some reason, they connect with me. I don't know what it is, but they all connect with me. And you know, whether it's Beverly Hills Cop or um, obviously Back to the Future, the Indiana Jones franchise. And here was one that I've always loved, and I found out recently had something to do with Psych in a way. I mean, up until I mean, to this day, my ringtone is the Fletch theme song. <laughs> um, I love Fletch, Eddie Murphy's Fletch. I even like Fletch Lives, which it might be a uh-huh. controversial thing for me to say, but I like Fletch Lives. Uh, uh-huh. It takes place, and there's an amusement park in that, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Bible Land, the unforgettable. Is there, <laughs> was there any inspiration from Fletch to Psych? Because I think I heard, I don't know if it was James Roday who said it, or maybe it was you. I read somewhere there was some kind of connection. Well, we, lo- yeah, Fletch was, was such a, it's, it's Chevy Chase's greatest moment. Absolutely. And, uh, um, He's hitting and, uh, it out of the park in every scene. Yeah. And it's perfect. And uh, I, I can't say I went along with Fletch lives. It was, that was one that's, that they shot when there was a writer's strike. So they couldn't, they couldn't do anything to the script and uh, it was misguided. I wish they'd given a third shot to, uh, to him to make another one. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but just the, the, the sort of crazy tone of Fletch, it's, it's really funny and, the mystery is kind of cool <laughs> and, and uh, in a way the John McDonald books were, uh, I hope I, I said is, uh, I think it's John McDonald's guy. Uh, right I think, book. I think, is it John or is it Jeff, Jeffrey McDonald? I don't know. I'm gonna look this up. One you of might those. be right. One of those. Uh, but, uh, but the books are, are really cool. There's a whole, a whole lot of it. And yeah, I, I loved it. And when, when I was in film school, you know, we, we would do directing classes or whatever, and people would say, okay, this scene's from Miss Julie or, you know, Agnes of God. And not, they're doing all these series. And literally, I would come in and I would say, all right, this is the airplane hanger scene from Fletch. <laughs> and the teachers are like, who in the hell is this guy? Why is he doing this to us? 
but uh, uh, but you know, to me, that was art. That was the you know that kind that level of comedy. So much of what Chevy Chase is doing is so fun and so nuanced, and uh, and yet so completely unbridled and freewheeling and and great. And you know, obviously that um, that there's a moment in time that that Chevy hit the perfect moment. And and that movie to me is, is, is just spectacularly fun and funny and surprising all the way through. And I didn't want to exactly do Fletch because I, it it was actually too sacred for me. Oh, right. (laughs) Cause it's like, if you try to do Fletch, you're you're trying to do Fletch, but I thought, you know, in the Sean Spencer character, a guy who, keeps talking people in the, in the circles to confuse them and to get into where he needs to go a little bit with the, uh, with the costumes and the uh, disguises, which James was a big proponent of. He, he loved uh, any time we could put him in a disguise. Uh, and I, I stayed away from it a little bit because of Fletch, but then we, then we embraced it fully. Uh, but it's just, it's just a, it's this perfect, it's just this perfect balance of, really smart lead character who's incredibly flawed, an incredibly damaged human being, but who's hilarious and you're going with him on any uh, on any on any misadventure that he's taking. I mean, irrational confidence at some points, right? Just yeah. For, oh, yeah, for to, sure. To be able to pull that off. The airplane scene is is one of the best, I think, in film history. I mean, <laughs> even, I mean, come on, guys, it's all ball bearings these days. I mean, the, the, but the lines from that movie, uh, what, I mean, uh, what is that your favorite scene? And do you have a favorite line from Fletch? I, well, I I love that scene. I, I I have to say, there's so many of them that I really love. There's a moment in there that I really find great, where he's actually to Dana Wheeler Nicholson. He's actually, and it's a small, tiny little moment. He's showing the Polaroids he took when he broke into the office, and that the and he's showing her, he's, and the the pictures are just flashes. You can't see if this was at all any at all legible. You'd see this. This is the dog that tried to attack me. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love that he owns that. And uh, he finds that hilarious. So I, I love the subtle, the subtle moments in there. I like, I like the driving, uh, the driving instructing uh, that he does with the kid who's trying <laughs> to steal the car. It's like the, the classic scenes, of course, are classic. And Gina Davis is so just gold in that movie. Like you just want to see a movie with her uh, because it's, it's such a nice, it's such a great relationship that, that, that the two of them have, especially, especially when they're looking at the, the microfilm, the microfiche. And then he's like, okay, lower, 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 lower. to the right. And you realize she's scratching his back. <laughs> It's, oh, it's just, it's such, it's such good stuff. Yeah. And, and you know, his, his, his deadpan delivery, I think uh, one of my favorites where he's, it's in the beginning and, you know, Stan Wick is setting up like, you know, what's going on or what have you. And then um, he says, uh, you do, you do own gloves, right? And he's like, oh, I rent them. I have an option to buy. <laughs> you know, it's just like, all right, that's where we are. I mean, I love that movie. And I love that there's DNA in Psych from Fletch. I mean, it's obviously not a, a one-to-one comparison, but you can see some inspiration there uh, uh, from, from that movie. Absolutely. And we, we had Tim Matheson direct a, a whole bunch of Psych episodes. And there's something magical about Tim Matheson and that he he is a master of getting cool shots he's always got the camera moving and but for some reason i don't know how he does this the sun looks brighter and the sky is bluer when he directs an episode (laughs) in vancouver i don't know how he does it but uh uh, you know i I, i've gone back and had to look at uh older episodes for for the movies for reference points because we're always cross-referencing one thing or another and i can always tell it's a matheson episode or, or matt shackman those two guys for some reason, they could always find a, a way to make it look crisper and more beautiful. Now, I'm almost ready to jump into Back to the Future because because this is kind of how this whole thing came about was because of Psych. And, and you all always had, um, if not movie parodies, I guess that might not be the right word, but like movie inspired episodes, film inspired episodes, whether it's the, uh, you know, the Indiana Jones kind of takeoffs. Uh, with the rusty dagger, uh, so the uh, greatest story in the history of basic cable, um, things like that. Uh, you know, there's always been ones that jumped off, and one that I absolutely loved. And I think I brought this up to you maybe when we had our uh, press junket interview for the third movie. But I love the hundredth episode being a hundred clues, a uh, takeoff yeah. of Clue the movie, which to me, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, feels like it's gotten more praise now than it did 10 years ago or when it came out. I think when it came out, it was kind of a bomb, right? 
I, that's the thing. You know, you're the first person uh, to, in the last 20 years <laughs> <laughs> to say that it, it, that movie did not do well and uh people were like like sort of laughed it off but now there's sort of this revisionist history that it was a big beloved movie at the time uh there were a lot of us who loved it and i did you know and and of course because of the tim curry and and, and the cast american and, duos he was in an episode yeah. of psych american duos yeah yes of course abs yeah yeah exactly but it was it, and john landis had a connection to the clue movie and and all that so I enjoyed the movie. I uh, I saw it in a theater when you could see one of the three uh, endings. And then I think I went to Blockbuster and rented the, the VHS so you could see the other endings and uh, all the, the, the tricks that you had to do with it. But it's a movie that has has been completely redefined by history. And people are, you know, when you say, oh, we did a Clue episode, they're, oh, God, I love that movie. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, OK, cool. I'm glad. Me too. Uh, I, I'm happy. And it was a really fun one to do because it was our 100th episode. And once again, Matt Shackman, one of the two guys who the sky looks bluer when uh, <laughs> when he does it. Uh, he was he was at the helm and uh, we flew up because I would only fly up for episodes I was directing or if there was a terrible problem because <laughs> the writer's room, the writer's room and the editing room was in Manhattan Beach. So I was I would I had a full time job there, you know, from morning till night. And then I could fly up to Vancouver, you know, if there was a huge problem, which didn't happen a lot, uh, or if I was prepping or, or directing an episode and I would do two a year. So I, I was up there for about four of the 16 a year and then I would go up whenever there was something. And during that episode, we got like the key to the city or something, but not I don't think it was the key to Vancouver. I think it was probably the key to Burnaby. Yeah, like or a suburb Whitlam or one yeah. of the smaller cities. Uh, but they were nice enough to give us a plaque. And then we had a cake with all that. But most importantly, uh, of course, I went up there to meet Christopher Lloyd. And because <laughs> there's so many, we had so many great people on the show. But meanwhile, I have to stay and do my job down in Manhattan Beach. So there, there are all these amazing people that have been on the show. I've never met Tim Curry. I wasn't there. And I freaking co-wrote that episode. Oh, man. <laughs> but didn't it, meet since him. it was yeah so so i went out there specifically to um to meet christopher lloyd and he was of course as as wonderful and amazing as as you experienced um uh, and and it was just and, and of course then of course oh hey there's martin mole over there <laughs> there's leslie and warren there's like there was a whole slew of uh, of of great guest stars that day and kurt smith of course who we've had the long love affair with uh, uh we got him to to sing and and to get mauled by a panther <laughs> in that episode <laughs> So it was, uh, it was, it was really a lot of, uh, a lot of fun. And, and that's one of those things we call a bottle episode where, you know, you just stay on one location and you save money by not, by not moving the trucks. But we didn't save any money at all because that set and that place was so expensive. <laughs> I can only imagine. I can only imagine you have this huge haunted mansion. And by the way, I mean, a young man growing up, uh, Leslie Ann Warren, it was like a, a very high on my on my list of, of childhood crushes, especially watching Clue the movie. So I'm sure that was a, a, a nice experience as well. Yeah. And what a lovely lady, you know, really, yeah. r- really sweet. And, uh, you know, just a, a great cast that week. Martin Mole, who's an amazing guitarist. I didn't know it. And painter. He's, he's the ultimate renaissance man. But he'd sit there and he'd start playing guitar. And and it, I'm like, this is so fun. How is this my job? <laughs> You know, just incredible, incredible. Just so what was people. what was Chris Lloyd like? I mean, uh, obviously, when you see him, everyone thinks, oh, my God, that's Doc Brown uh, or Professor Plum, you know, um, yeah. both a professor or and a Jimmy, doctor. Or Jim Ignatowski. Or, or Jim Ignatowski, Mar- of course. Martin from My Favorite Martian. Any of those. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, of course, Judge Doom uh, from yeah, Who so. Framed Roger Rabbit, another Zemeckis classic. Um but but what I me mean, well, to walk me through it. I mean, did you beeline toward him? Did you try to play it cool? Like what was it? I tried to play it cool, and I'm I'm very unsuccessful at playing it cool. <laughs> so I was I uh, I did beeline right over to him, and then I stood there, and then I just waited for the moment because you never know when they're going. So a lot of actors will come up and they just want to go back to their trailer, you know, and so. And you want I want to give them their that time. If that's if that's her process. I certainly want to want to do that. But he was on set, so 
<laughs> I had the t- I had the the target right on him. I walked right over and I just said, "Hey, I'm just so grateful. I'm so happy. I'm such a fan." And I'm like, "Oh God, stop talking, stop talking, stop talking." <laughs> uh, um, and he's just he was re- he's exactly the opposite of Doc Brown. He's really reserved. He's really thoughtful uh, in his words. He's he's super uh, uh, genuine and and quiet and uh, and 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 fo- but very kind. Uh, nonetheless, and, and uh, he was, he was game for anything that we, that we wanted to do up there. So it was, it was everything I hoped for. I mean, ex- except, you know, like hanging out for a long time, but once again, I don't want to bother him. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, you know, I, he didn't start, let me tell you about, uh, let me tell you about this taxi episode, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. You whereas, know, whereas the, the opposite of that was uh, we had John Reese Davies from Flight Sala on Indiana, Indiana Jones, Jones. Uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, a couple of them. And he, you meet him. His voice fills the room and he immediately, Liz Taylor, 1960, and he just goes and you just sit down and listen. And uh, it, it's extraordinary. Well, he's got the iconic voice, right? Like, like yeah, you oh want to hear yeah. him. You want to hear him do it. I actually think they did a um, you may have seen. Did you see the documentary about the fan film that they did for Raiders of the Lost yeah. Ark? I yeah. think he like I think he uh, narrates the documentary if I have it right. But what, he what a great guy! I think he was a museum curator in Psych. Right? Yes, 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 yeah, just yes. So good. We we never thought we'd get him. He lives in it was at the time. I don't know if he still does. He's living in Christchurch uh, of New Zealand. Uh, you know, they, that's, that's one of the most southernmost, like the winds off the Arctic come straight through, <laughs> uh, there and he flew all the way up, uh, and, and, but he did it and it was, it was really a lot of fun and what a, what a, what a great, uh, time it was, uh, to hang out with him and meet him and, and just, just a, also a, a great guy. And he told so many stories that my brain overloaded and I can't remember the details to almost all of them. <laughs> You just know there was a premise somewhere with Liz Taylor in the 60s. Is it Liz Taylor and Richard Harris and Peter O'Toole, maybe? Uh, that sounds right. Oh, man. Just so great. Uh, uh, and, and to me, Psych had so many of those great and, – and, and to me, I know you've ref, – Back to the Future was referenced in Psych uh, a few – Oh, a lot, yeah. A few times. I, I, I can't think of any, the specific lines, but I know that they've come up a, a lot. Um, Chris Lloyd, I'm sure, was fun to have. Was there never a – man, Leah Thompson would be great or, or Tom Wilson or, or anything like that? We, uh, we had Tom Wilson. Oh, that's right. Uh, he put, yeah. Yeah, he we did, he did the he did a sort of um, Henry story where they had the hands on a on a truck uh, competition. Yeah. So we got and of course we got uh, we got Billy Zane who played Match. Right. Uh, yes, Billy Zane was in there. Yeah, yeah. Of so course. If you know the if you know the name of Billy Zane's character in Back to the Future, you're a true true fan. That's yeah. a, that's that's a very uh, a very uh, uh, solid dividing line. Do you know the other uh, two names of the Biff gang members? Uh, 3D, right? Yes. You know, th- oh my God! What do I, what's who's the third one? Uh, there's 3D and Match and Skinhead. Oh, I don't know. Skinhead. What? Skinhead. Skinhead. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, Billy Zane. Yeah, Billy Zane was in the. Wasn't he in the final season of Psych? Yeah, he was. He was in the in the last episode. The last episode uh, yeah. before the movie. And we had referenced Billy Zane in just about all seasons uh, leading up to it. <laughs> We and he was uh, he was like really you did that yeah <laughs> so we went back and showed him the thing but that that got him on the show he was uh, he was excited to do it that's the same way we got Val Kilmer we uh, we we told Val Kilmer uh, we we'd referenced him fifteen times you know we'd actually only referenced him probably seven <laughs> but, uh, but <laughs> hey, fudge the numbers it's okay man I, I can't believe I let that slip the episode with Tom Wilson yeah there there there's the truck that they can't take their hand off of right yeah and, yeah that's yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's it. But yeah. but that was it. We never got Leah Thompson. She she was doing. Uh, she's become a director. She's a really mm-hmm. good director. Very she has good. a lot of Goldbergs and stuff. If she had been doing one hours at our time, I would have loved to have her direct some psych episodes. Um, you know, maybe in whatever um, incarnation we come up with uh, next, we can get her to do that. But I'd love to have her on screen. That would be uh, that would be uh, fantastic. So there it is. There it is. Part one of my conversation with Steve Franks. 
man, how great was he? How great is he? He's just a gem of a human being. And uh, I really appreciate Steve for coming on the show. Next week, we will do part two of that interview where we really get deep into Back to the Future and much, much more. I want to thank my guest, Steve Franks. Also, I want to give my respects one more time to the late, great Gilbert Gottfried. And thank you to all the pinheads who make this show possible every single week. Make sure you go check out seasons one through eight of Back to the Future, the podcast. But until next time, until next week. This is Back to the Future, the podcast, the only podcast looking back in time, greatest film trilogy of all time, Back to the Future. I'm your friend in time, Brad Gilmore. We'll see you in the future.